from a middle market standpoint, we try to be in that 10 to $75 million deal range. So we're not competing against the bigger institutions. So if we are the institutional face within the middle market and, and run it like an institution, that's where we feel like we've been able to create the, the biggest success. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Jeff Toporak, a founding partner of Elf D. Stonewater, had more than 30 years of experience in this industry, completed $8 billion plus in acquisitions, direct sales, and financing. And financing. There's not too many guests who have had that kind of experience on the show. So I know you are going to learn a lot from Jeff today. Jeff, welcome to the show. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm honored to meet you. I, I can't say I've had too many guests who have completed more than $8 billion in, in uh, acquisitions. Uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Whitney. Yeah, Glad honored, to be here. Honored. And so, Jeff, let's dive in, though. I, obviously, the listeners and myself want to know a little bit about your background and, I mean, getting to the spot of completing $8, $8 billion in acquisitions. That's, that's something, right? Not many of us can say that. What was before real estate, Jeff? And and then let's go through your career in, in this business a little bit. Yes. I graduated from the University of Michigan with an organizational behavior degree. I was more of a choose your own adventure, not really sure where that was going to take me. And I was at JP Morgan in 1994, really when commercial real estate securitization was just starting. And I worked there and work on their first two securitizations, which is a really exciting time coming out of the early 90s recession. And then I ultimately realized real estate is something I really enjoyed doing. It would, felt tangible to me. I could walk to it. It had a very creative component to it with the architecture and interior build outs and different space uses. And uh, was it just a product on a piece of paper? And I then left and went to Eastill, and I was at Eastill for about eight years. The firm at that time was literally 20 people. I was one of three associates at the firm and just got tremendous exposure to, to really everything about real estate. And th that's where a lot of my transaction experience came from was working on big portfolios selling the first two funds for, for Blackstone and just getting exposure to all sorts of people in the business that at the time I probably had no idea, you know, how amazing those people were, but I was right. in situations at a really early age of getting to interact and learn from, you know, some of the greatest mentors in the business. Wow. So how long was that until. I was just like your progression to where you're at now. Sure. So that was from 2000, sorry, that was from 1996 to 2003. And then in 2003, kind of coinciding with starting a family uh, and, and buying my first house, that was uh, a little bit of a crazy thing to do was to uh, ask my wife if it was okay to start a business um, on the principal side and, uh, Lucky for her, she said, look, I, I grew up in a two bedroom apartment. If it blows up, we can, we can always, as long as we love each other, we can, we can always go back and live in the apartment together. And in 2003, I left with one of my current partners today, David stayed, he had not, he and I worked together since 1998 and we started the principal business really doing uh, single tenant investing when we left East Hill. We, we had our first venture with Fortress and then that kind of snowballed into a second venture with Fortress. And then we had another one with Garrison and one of those ventures, we, we bought our first government deal and that's where we met the remainder of our partners. They advised us on the transaction and we were in the trenches with them for, for three years and really got to know them really well. And ultimately decided to merge our companies when they left a larger firm and kind of joined forces in, in 2010. So at the time it was, 
six partners at that point. And now the firm is 10 partners and 43 professionals around the country. So wow. it's been an exciting ride. Speak to your all's focus now, and maybe was that the focus 10 years ago and, and what you all are focused on now? Sure. Everything we do is a, is a niche business. Real estate's not rocket science. If you're halfway smart and you can roll up your sleeves and, and really try and, and really try and get dirty and be creative, you can be, you can be successful and semi, semi dangerous. And we have always focused on very niche strategies. We have three different business lines. So we have a federal consulting business where we advise owners around the country on how to attract or retain the federal government as a tenant. So that's a national business. So former head of the GSA is on that team, former other government officials and agency officials are on that team. So very kind of specialized product. Then we have a development business where we have a few different verticals there. We do built a suits for federal and state governments around the country, all very mission critical things like FBI headquarters in Atlanta. We've done some VA facilities. We do labs for DEA. So very mission critical focus there. We also have a joint venture on student housing with the price companies. We do corporate built to suits. We most recently won a couple of defense contractor deals that are pretty large, all very secure, highly mission critical assets. And then we have our investment and asset management business where we have our single tenant strategy, primarily with our single tenant active return fund. And then we have a government adjacent private sector strategy. So we've done other things in the past, but there's overlap within all of those across the platform. And, and really what we try and do is how do you position yourself where your company is uniquely positioned in order to execute a transaction? That's something that is in 30 plus years in the business is not easy to accomplish. And you can really only do that when you have the experience and the talent to accomplish that. Well, I'd love to talk about that just a little bit too. Like you, you just said, or you said a number of things, but you or I'm going to back up even a little more. You said you, you focus on niches, right? And, and of course, and you all have a number of things, right? That, that you all do right within the business. But, but then I love even at the end, you said, how do you make your company uniquely positioned to be able to complete the transaction? Are there maybe an example you can think of where, you know, where that hammers home, like we were uniquely positioned and able to do this, maybe where somebody else couldn't have or something like that. Sure. There's, there's actually several, but along the very, very much the same theme. So in our single tenant business, it's very often perceived as a passive business where it's coupon clipping, you buy it, put it on the shelf, you wait for the tenant to tell you whether they're going to renew or not. We take a very, very different approach. We, we really view, since it is a Michigan critical asset, our job is to be a partner with a tenant and try and figure out how we can help them achieve their business goals at the site, yet also have the corporate expertise to be able to talk to the C-level suite. We've had a couple of leases that have had obligations for the landlord to execute expansions of buildings. We had one north of Grumman in Dayton, Ohio. We, we have a manufacturing facility right now in Yuma, Arizona that we're doing that with. And we have another defense contractor in Huntsville, Alabama, very similar type of situation where most passive investors don't really have the development expertise to execute an expansion for a tenant. And typically those are very complicated because the tenant is still occupying the existing premises. You're not just building a separate building. You're actually continuing their operation, getting the expansion done. So our development team comes in and really advises the, the tenant on how to value engineer, what they're thinking about in terms of design, getting really involved in the operations of 
adding lines to a manufacturing plant, not just using it as storage and helping them figure out the most cost effective way to get it done. And those tenants are not in the development and real estate business. They want to be doing what they're good at, which is executing their business. So having a value proposition where our development team can actually fully execute a real estate expansion for them is tremendously beneficial. And it's usually, it's a, it's a pretty easy win-win for both sides. And we typically get lease extensions and get the expansion done. That's been a, a great example of, of how we kind of work across the platform together. Instead of that tenant looking to move somewhere else. Exactly. And they have those choices. If there's an existing plant somewhere else with the capacity, they could actually just move there. We've had that come up in, in the past, but most of those people who are at these facilities don't really want to move. And it's getting that information on the ground with the facilities people to understand their pain points of what do you need and, and walking the facilities and understanding what they do as a business. We don't really view our job as just a real estate landlord collecting a rent check. Um, we're trying to be their partner to help them succeed in their business. Cause ultimately if they succeed, it's a pretty easy translation to we're going to succeed. Yeah, for sure. No, I love that. And it sounds like you all have been creative in, in adding these other uh, ways that you all have been able to do this. So you listed so many now, and it's interesting. And of course, doing this for, you know, 30 plus years, I can see this happening, just the evolution of how the business has grown and your all's expertise and all these things. You all are focused on niche, but you know, when, uh, maybe you can talk us through like just the thought process as a, as an organization to determine, okay, we are going to go into this and become an expert in this other niche as well, or maybe this niche over here, or how do you not just have shiny object syndrome, right? Obviously. When you all have grown like you have, you got a lot more, uh, there, there's a lot of things you could do, right? Uh, right. And, and so how, how do you all determine that a little bit as a company and, and how do you lead in that way to determine, okay, this is a niche that we should pursue or not? Yeah, I could give you two very recent examples of, look, we, we try and diversify, but we try and do it organically. We try and do it where the company is prepared and is able to take on that additional business. Uh, we're not a volume shop, so the quality of what comes out of it with our brand name on it is very, very meaningful to us. So we want to make sure that whatever we take on, we can execute at really the, the top level possible. And so, you know, we, we recently expanded into corporate build to suit it was a natural transition because we were already doing that on the government build to suit side, building secure facilities for them. And so the natural DV, one standard deviation away is expanding into corporate. It just so happens that the two first deals that we participated in RFP, we won partially because our track record on having done it for the government was so solid for 15 years of executing for the government. There was an easy decision. Do we know that was going to be an easy decision? Not really. But we also have to be careful in, okay, how much of that business can we really take on? We want to be able to really deliver high quality um, assets. So we were looking to expand into the industrial space. And this, I think, will give you a good sense of, of kind of how we think about things. We started looking at markets like Charleston and Charlotte and, and really start to realize the institutions already started coming in. So one key criteria is, we always look at secondary and tertiary markets. And then from a middle market standpoint, we try to be in that 10 to $75 million deal range. So we're not competing against the bigger institutions. So if we are the institutional face within the middle market and, and run it like an institution, that's where we feel like we've been able to create the, the biggest success. Um, but when we were looking at the industrial market, we, we really lacked conviction. And so what we did was we hired someone from the outside that had a 20 year logistics background, former military, really understood the business from a global perspective. And what we ended up doing was creating a business plan 
from the ground up that was for emerging markets, near shoring, inland ports, and identifying land opportunities around that. I mean, that's kind of as niche as you can get. And ultimately, what we need is that gut check of, do we have conviction in anything we do? If we're wishy-washy and kind of feeling a little neutral, not that excited about something, it's not a deal that we need to do. So do we have conviction uh, about what we're going to do? Right? And if we're, yeah, wishy-washy, uh, uh, there's too many, there's too many variables, right? There's too many roadblocks that are going to happen or mountains that are going to have to be climbed, right? And if you're wishy-washy, you're not, you're not going to want to climb the mountain, right? Well, and, and the last thing we want to do is get into an asset or a business that in your gut, you feel like is potentially going to be a problem because guess what? When it's a problem, those problems percolate straight to the top. So they ultimately become my and my partner's problems. We're not looking to lose more sleep at night. <laughs> so, you know, look, e even to the best of your predictions and your best of your due diligence, there are plenty of deals that we go into that don't necessarily start off on the right foot and you've immediately got to figure out a way to get it back on track and being nimble and having that experience of it gets back to solving problems and being creative and really just being relentless. You, you have to, when you have passion about something and you get roadblocks that get thrown in front of you and someone's building a brick wall, well, you can feel closed in and you feel like there's no way over or through it, but you've just got to be creative and having a great team around you is one of the best ways to get that done of being able to brainstorm different things and being using the different levers of, of, of how to get through situations. Any, any tips on, on how you and your, you and your business partner solve problems together for the business? A lot of it is, is brainstorming. I think that there, for us, there's no ego in the room. There's no pride of authorship. If. If there's an issue, any one of my partners, even if I'm not involved in the deal, should feel like they can call me and pick my brain. Because at the end of the day, I don't necessarily need the expertise that they have. They just need a sounding board to strategically think through whether it's a, a personal communication situation or just thinking of something outside the box. And sometimes the best way to do that is to talk to someone who's not in the trenches who doesn't know how to do that uh, or doesn't know the specifics of it, but you trust their opinion. And that's the big part of it. We've got 10 partners. We've been partners for a long time. There's a tremendous amount of trust there where you know that everybody's rowing in the same direction and trying to achieve the same goal and really having open and honest communication. It, if that breaks down, your ability to get to a creative solution um, really kind of goes away. You need to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly of what it is that you can do differently. And you need to learn from some of those mistakes and try and not repeat them. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I just wonder, obviously, I think all the listeners can relate to, well, so many things you've mentioned here, whether it's shiny object syndrome or running off, hey, we can go do this thing or whatever, should we, right? But even the, the, how you're working with partners, right? And the brainstorming and the no pride of authorship, but it's like, we're all coming together for this, to get to the goal, right? And, and making these determinations and, and brainstorming, thinking out loud. And, and I, yeah, it just it makes so much sense. I, I guess one more thing before we have to end this segment, what would you say is a, is a challenge right now for LT Stone Water. I mean, what's, what's, what's the challenge you all are, are working through right now? I think everybody is going through challenges today, right? Where the, the capital markets are, are severely, severely challenged, lack of liquidity on the, on the debt and equity side. And we're working on problems that might be a year or two from now 
and just try and get that risk off the table. And I think for your listeners, while you need to focus on the problems that are right in front of you, you also need to keep your eye on the ball of where the next two to three moves might be down the road and how you're going to go solve those because they impact the decision you may need to make today. And so having the forethought of where things might be headed and anticipating what those issues might be, that's where I think we're spending a lot of our time. We don't necessarily have fires blazing today, but I remember during the Great Recession, I had, we had two years where there were no fires blazing. And you're trying to just figure out, well, there's going to be something. Like, how do you anticipate it? And, and I think having had enough experience, I think we can anticipate some of it and take advantage of some of it. I mean, an easy example was when the market got wonky on the, on the forward curve, where basically the market said, oh, we don't really believe what the Fed is saying. It gave us an opportunity to actually do some forward hedges and take risk off the table in within a three week window, being able to do that. Now that came from a, a, a kind of a silly conversation I had. I had never really done a forward hedge, but we called one of our banks and said, Hey, is this something that we can do? The one, the one thing I know I'm, I'm pretty good at is asking what I think are really dumb questions. And I've been always surprised at how they're probably not dumb. So making an assumption of you think one answer when you never ask the question is, is something that I think is a, is a great recommendation for anybody. I've been shocked my entire career that most of my dumb questions aren't actually that dumb. We, we have this internal thing, right? It's almost a pride thing too. We're afraid we're going to look, look bad if we ask a silly question, right? And it, yeah, it I've never opposite. I've never been afraid of the way I look or, or, or potentially sounding stupid. It, it provides good humor for everybody else. That's awesome. I, yeah. No, I think it's great advice, Jeff, to say the least. No, no dumb questions, right? Ask uh, your questions. Hey, Jeff, how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? They could reach me at jtoporek. T-O-P-O-R-E-K at FDStonewater.com. And they could learn more about the firm at www.FDStonewater.com. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.